I was going to just say a few things because I suppose I have known Vanessa for a number of years, really through through the arts world, um, and then through that knowing her, her getting to know how her practice has unfolded, and I suppose where swimming is really at the centre of it, and I think. Um, I suppose in a way that she, her, what she has done and how she has evolved and developed the practice has been absolutely moving and inspiring to me. Um, I, she was in studios where I work in Temple Bar Gallery and Studios, so I'm impressed with it on so many levels and from the beautiful act of creative art that she makes out of it, but also the, I think the communities and the networks that she makes. And this is, I suppose, all, all the people here. Um, so I just thought that, anyway, it's probably very fitting that it begins today um, in the shadow of Joyce's Tower up at the 40 foot, the, 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 you know, this symposium, but as part of her larger project, which she got wonderful Arts Council funding for um, swimming a long way together. But that I suppose under, under Joyce's Tower, we can't but help think of the unquenchable spirit of an odyssey that is gonna unfold and how that really happens in people swimming and taking to the water, the, the long um, endurance swimming, which I do never, I have never done myself. And, and um, I suppose I don't, I, I, I just think it's just unbelievable, unbelievable. It, 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 I just read Mercedes Gleit's book and, uh, and I suppose in a way it can take your breath away, but I'm gonna hear from you. So as, as I say that I, I suppose swimming is, is centered in her art and I'm just thinking about the repetitive act of the bodily movement through water that is enlivening and exhausting and being at one with the sea, the river, within the elements of water as invisible frontiers are transversed, yielding at times a meditative sleepiness resistance to the pain from freezing seas, hour after hour after hour, currents pushing you this way or that, jellyfish stinging, and in the company of all kinds of sea creatures, pushing the limits of the body. And I suppose what this kind of act of swimming is in one way, I always feel when I'm in the water and I swim, which is about like 20 minute swim from the slip to the rock and back. And I think I'm, I think I'm marvelous, but I still feel the effects of that, the breath and the life and the feeling that, of invigoration that it gives to every cell in your body. But, it, so, but at this, it is also something that you are on your own in the water. And yet I think what's vital about this project and what it does is it, it sort of touches into the spirit of collaboration and a connection to communities and places, to people who swim and the boat people, the mappers, and then this lovely, absolutely beautiful idea that I think was taken from Mercedes Gleitz as well, the idea of the, the singing alongside the swimming. And yesterday evening on the River Liffey, a few of us had the privilege of seeing the kind of, I suppose the opening event of the Swimming a Long Way Together, where Vanessa and a group of swimmers, and I'm sure there's some of you from here, swam from Butt Bridge up to the Haypenny Bridge and formed this delicate circle of swimmers with beautiful, transparent sculptures on their heads and then a boat came along and Ruth Clinton with Landless sang and I have to say it was it was like a mirage and we looked at it from the top of the balconies in Temple Bar very privileged view but many people gathered below and were lulled into this whole you know scene that was I suppose not too um it was totally unexpected, a beautiful surprise amongst the kind of madness of Dublin City on a Friday night um, <laughs> with all the grunge and fireworks going off in the square. Um, I think we should mention as well, because it probably may get mentioned, is this amazing figure of Mercedes Gleitz, who was, um, her, whose daughter wrote the book, uh, gosh, what's the book Dollaranda. called? What? Dollaranda. Dollaranda, yes. What's the name of her book? Oh, in the way. In the way, yeah. Um, but she, again, this thing of the, I, I think, um, uh, so Anna Maria Mullally, which was Anna Maria, you're doing a PhD on, on, women's, on swimming in the, women swimmers in the 1920s. That's, yeah, so that, that's a fascinating period of time for women. When I suppose we think back, it was just the suffragettes, but even in terms of, you know, artistic practice it was the men getting all the chances, Picasso, et cetera and uh, women were even kept out of art colleges and you know they were crafting was the big big was the big thing that they were probably allowed to do but that is all obviously broken down but with this pioneering amazing woman that Mercedes Gleitz was 
and she was I think she must have been born fearless and with this incredible desire for um, just doing what she wanted to do and with a powerful a powerful a body and physique and she swam for hours and hours in the water she was the first woman to swim the channel and you will probably speak about her so I don't want to take away no, anything you're saying um, but the 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 it, it it's absolutely um it, it you know it, it, it's in the spirit of this that I think evoked a lot of ideas for for Vanessa and um, and the and the whole symposium. So that spirit will will come will come to the fore. I think the other thing that I suppose we have to say is that we've just come through a pandemic, and more than ever, I got, um, I'm often out at Sea Point, and the 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 amazing number of people that took to swimming this last bit has been absolutely it's been like a revolution and um, i think it's sort of weaned away a little bit i kind of hope it has some to some extent because of it absolutely <laughs> jammers and of course the dry robes came into fashion as well so that was that was uh but 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 really at the heart of this and it is is the sense that we did get a chance to look a bit at nature and to feel you know that we're you know that i suppose we slowed down we stopped we started to notice, notice things. There was less cars, less moving around. We couldn't move anyway, but we, you know, so we, so we attended to what was in our vicinity and in our in our locale, and we heard bird songs we hadn't heard before. We, we, we suddenly got this kind of weird, even though if it was also tragic, opportunity to um, to take a moment. And now I think that moment is important, and it's about, I suppose, taking care, taking care of our world, and that we are at one with our world. And I think that this symposium and talking about swimming is gonna strike that amazing note again, the, with that is a subject matter that, you know, to use a word that maybe we don't always love to use, but it is absolutely in the zeitgeist. And that is, um, that is desperately important. So um, thank you, Vanessa, for making all of this happen. I do want to say there's a, a team of people as well with Vanessa, Rosie, Rosie um, Herman there, who's the curator and there's a, a great gang of people who are obviously working away um, today. So that's it. I just want to say the panel then. Um, so um, Philip, Philip Hoare is, uh, is, a, is a writer and he is the uh, professor of creative writing in the University of Southampton. And uh, he's written many books, I think 11 books and won prizes. And I heard one of your books as an audio book, I think on BBC Four, and I think it was uh, um, Rising Tide, Falling Star, an absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. And you've written most recently about Albert Durer and um, Imagining and the Whale and the Art of the World. So Philip is going to be the first speaker. And then Lisa Cummins and, uh, and Rosie Foley are English Channel swimmers, which my, <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable, yeah, unbelievable, yeah, and that I don't know, uh, that is, that is, uh, that is, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is just double. phenomenal. Double. She's done a double, double English, double English yeah, over swimming. and back. I don't know. Once you, was you, 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 it is remarkable, yeah. So anyway, congratulations. <laughs> and um, then uh, Anna Marie Mullally I, is a really interesting PhD subject matter. So that's a wonderful. Um, and then Carrie Fure. <laughs> You tell us about you quickly. Um, quickly, I'm here chairing um, the, the, the the talks. I don't think I've got much to do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm a distant swimmer, but not in the league of these guys. I was a founder of the Outdoor Swimming Society, and I'm an artist, and I specialise in making leather from fish skin. And at the moment, I'm I'm doing artist books about swimming and fish skin and organic practices fantastic and the artist book is a wonderful space as well <laughs> so with no further ado will philip love to introduce you then why do we swim down to the end of the pier off the beach on the riverbank at the end of the world where all the laws run out all the hierarchies, constrictions, and the debts, all the identities and the gravity and the wanting 
and the yearning to be set free of the way you want to be or once were. <clears throat> like Ishmael's water gazers at the tip of Manhattan in Moby Dick, we look into the water and see reflections of ourselves, our souls in the sea, ourselves perfectly ironed out and weightless, set free. Everyone is beautiful in the sea. Where did they come from, these watery people? And where are they going to? Oscar is the only wild swimmer I'll admit to, perched on the rough-hewn barnacly rocks of the 40-foot drop, watching the boys with their Jesuitical rosaries around their necks to protect themselves from the snot-green, scrotum-tightening sea <laughs> as they jump in. Ten years later, Already wreathed in fame and notoriety, we find Oscar on the beach at Fire Island, discarding his seal and fur coat and his melancholy Jura pose number one to don his tight-fitting bathing suit and espadrilles. He stands there, looking out to his future, like Gatsby looking for Daisy, then swims like a shark, as his son recalled as if someone or something were chasing him. Ten years later, he flees the country that jailed him, taking the ferry to France to build a beach hut with a drift with Madonna as its figurehead, as he washed off that hard labour in La Manche, declaring himself sinless once more. But then, writing to Bosey, tells him he has a bathing suit ready for him. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is the forty-foot drop and you get in my chest. <clears throat> Virginia's in the water with Rupert, skinny dipping by the light of the moon. All those naked Bloomsbury follicks. Rupert boasting he can emerge from cold water with an erection. <laughs> Virginia courting her lovela, lover, the lovely Vita, whom she calls her porpoise, reporting that future biographers will never believe that all her work was caught in the sign of a single fin swimming far off. She casts a flowery wreath off the white cliffs at the end of England to be caught by Ophelia lying on her back in a tin bath lit and warmed by candles. Then she piles her pockets with stones and takes her last dip. Meanwhile, Gerard Hopkins is living up to his manly name <laughs> as he writes his last poem in Dublin. Such a dark city to him in his exile, recalling all his glorious swims. <coughs> Excuse me. We're there, we're there on the riverbank with him. We are there, as he writes, when we hear a shout and the riot of a rout of, it must be, boys from the town bathing. It is summer's sovereign good. He drops towards the river unseen, sees the bevy of them, how the boys with dare and with down dolphin rebel bright bodies huddling out our earth world, air world, water world, through all hurled, all by turn and turn about. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Folkestone, H.G. Wells catches a mermaid in his arms. Rescued from the shore like a stranded dolphin, he dresses her up in a pitcher hat and wheels her about the port in a bath chair. It's an allegory for prejudice, and we realise before she returns home, she will drag him out with her, leaving only her silk wrap behind. Mm. On the same beach, Mary Shelley is swimming into her 60s, defying her age and the onlookers, in memory of her sodden, drowned lover, Percy, who would deliberately sink to the bottom, as if on a practised run, telling Trelawney, why did you save me? In another moment, I should have been on another planet. And when his body is dragged from the med, they find his last notebook still stashed in his pocket. Its sepia squid ink drawings of weird, watery beasts 
washed away as if the whole book and the poet too had gone through a spin cycle. Byron burns his friend on the beach. Shelley's sizzling heart is saved from the flames. As the mad, bad Lord wades out to the sea, swims, vomits and returns. While the star man falls to earth like Icarus, swimming like a dolphin in the sea that raged no more. The white legs kicking in the air as the world goes round uncaring while Turner's enslaved people are thrown overboard to found a new aquatic black utopia down there from the unborn. And while the rotting remnants of Jericho's raft wash up on an, another Italian shore, Thoreau plums the hundred feet of Walden with a lead weight and swims at dawn to bring back the heroic ages. While the train runs by, and the town council declares the weather that the water is too full of piss. And Baudelaire says swimming is like being kissed a hundred times a minute. And Swinburne throws his body sadomasochistically off the rocks and into the waves. And Beckett with his sea eagle eyes and sea creature claws and Oscar with his wild seaweedy locks look on into the black lock in the fearful entangling weeds while Sylvia crawls into the bay again and again calling for her daddy in the only lines in that terrible poem that allow a window of light and beauty and the possibility of escape. I quote, big as a Frisco seal ahead in the freakish Atlantic where it pours bean green over blue in the waters of beautiful Norset. I used to pray to recover you. And she stretches out her untanned body on the sand in a white bikini, her hair peroxided in honour of Marilyn, with copies of the wave and Moby Dicks, the waves and Moby Dick stashed in her beach bag. All she really needed was the sea. All we really need is the sea. We sink our own preconceptions of what we should be and where we should go when all the time the water lies out there. There will we be out of reach, forbidden territory, as foreign as any planet. There at our bare naked feet, the rising and falling of the moon, a watery star, while the shooting stars never stop falling and rising on the other side of the world. We are all connected in the same amniotic fluid where we heard the world first, through the salt sea of our mother's womb as our proto-embryo selves and those paddle limbs which might develop into anything, to a whale, a mermaid, a fish or a thylacine, unfurling and uncurling in that blood-warm sea. The sea is the queerest place, full of queer things like you and me. It's where we came from and where we return to in all of our watery, wild-hearted, reckless, beautiful, black and white, technicolour dreams, unfurled, hurled into the water again and again and again, day after day, night after night, till we get it right. And at dawn, the 40 foot is filled with creatures bobbing about, swirling in a salty whirlpool like the selkies they really are. At dawn, the fit women of Seapoint don their woolly hats and slip into the ocean under the silvery grey sky, while the headland floating on the horizon is a barometer of the day ahead. It reminds me of something very like something I can't forget. We are charged by the water, plugged into it, the ever-changing population of the sea, where everyone is everyone out there, the uproarious teams, the sedate black back floaters and the in-betweeners, clutching onto the rusty handrails before setting themselves adrift like astronauts. <laughs> the soaring, swooping, cracking turns and the pterodactylian cormorants and the seals lounging on the rocks like lazy, overripe bananas. <laughs> the patient Jack Russells waiting for their humans to return the sun and the wind and the rain and the tide, always the tide, the only time we know. 
Time is suspended and so are we out there in outer space, our only truly communal space. The square green trains take us round the bay and round the bend and out the other side of nothing and everything in between. The sea is inside us and in ourselves, out there where we're projected into the future out of a timeless past. All going on together at the same time, the here and the now and the then. All before we thought we knew what we should be, but could be after all. And this is what we were all along, out there, bobbing along. And this is what we shall be, always bobbing gently along. I wanted to ask one specific question mm. about the Manly Hopkins. That, mm. Is that your Manly Hopkins or is it a Manly Hopkins? No, it's Gerald Manly Hopkins who... Um, and what, what's the name of it? It's called Epithamalian and it's the last poem he wrote. And he wrote it as a wedding gift to his brother Everard, who was an artist who actually worked for uh, Woman's World under Oscar Wilde's editorship. Oh. And Gerald Manley Hopkins um, came to Dublin in 1884 Mm. Uh, famously, Man Hopkins, obviously, uh, he's a Jesuit priest, but mm. a great poet, as I'm sure you all, all know. Uh, and he uh, was utterly obsessed with swimming. Okay. This and, was something I really didn't know. No, I've no. loved Manly Hopkins for mm. years. Um, his descriptions of flight and... Yeah. Uh, but this, that was just wonderful. Well, it's ca 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 characteristic of his last ever poem, the last thing he should write, which was here in Dublin in his room on St. Stephen's Green in Newman House, up there, up high in his room, his roof room there, I went to it during the week. Um, and it has, he, like, he puts down dolphinry. And it's kind of one word. Yeah, he just it, puts, uh, down dolphinry. What yeah. a brilliant expression, you know. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so when you, when you look back to his work through that kind of watery lens, you see this person who was only, you know, Jesuits had to put a powder in the bath so they couldn't look at their own bodies when they were in the bath. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes to the water, <laughs> and in the poem, later on in the poem, he talks about taking off his clothes, dropping his linen and everything on the floor, and he's naked. He's a naked priest, but is he a priest anymore? Is he a dolphin? You know, and that sense of um, utter liberation from everything that he'd been constricted by, you know, by life he'd chosen. He'd chosen to become a priest, uh, but he talked about himself as being a eunuch. Um, but he was made sensual by the, by the sea mm -hmm. and by the river. Mm -hmm. uh, he regained his physical beauty. Yes. His pale body, I think of his poems as being tattooed on his skin. You know, Jesuits yeah. weren't allowed to own anything. He could not own a book. He could own nothing at all. Um, all his poems he only read out once. When he sent out the wreck of the Deutschland for Robert Bridges in the post, it was the only copy of it. If it had been lost in the post, that would be the end of it. Um, <laughs> So he's this remarkable person. I don't know how you just arrived in and got the sea point so perfectly. Wow. That, that is amazing. I've Did been you... going there twice a day. I've been commuting to sea point ah, every day. Okay. I've okay. been going there twice a day. The rusty rail uh, the, and the yeah, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Such a beautiful place. But the most beautiful thing about coming here and realising, not only have I sort of met my people in a way, you know, um, in, the, uh, in all sorts of ways, but the way that swimming here is a communal act which is not an exclusive act, it's totally inclusive. It's, um, it's incredibly moving, actually, mm. when you see people gathering with this one intent, this craziness. I mean, it's kind of crazy to jump in the sea uh, 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 and, uh, and to regard that as something it's necessary for the soul. Yeah. Yeah. But you said about yeah. lockdown, you yeah. know, it's been the saving of people's mental states during yeah. lockdown, I think. Yeah. Nature in general. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it it's yeah. not ironic that, you know, obviously the irony is that we could only hear the, hear the birds once we'd stop shouting. Um, but that they, nature comes back to kind of save us, really, in a yeah. way. Yeah. The birds have never sung louder. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel we owe that debt back, yeah. really. Wonderful start to the day. Shall we... Uh, move on to the next speaker. I'd like to say that it was really lovely to hear what Philip had to say. Um, he identified the kind of elemental nature of the sea, 
the transcendent and emancipatory dimensions that there are to sea swimming, to being immersed. And in fact, I think we all found ourselves immersed in the kind of lyrical flow of his words. Um, and he also pinpointed something which is really important, which is the sensuous and erotic nature of, of this as well, too. Um, it is a, a bodily experience, this immersive experience, and we experience it not only intellectually, not all, but, but with our, 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 all our senses, through our skin. And, and it's a, it gives us great pleasure, even in moments of great pain. So I think um, those are themes that are going to come up over and over again today. Um, these themes of, of how we experience the water, why we need the water, and how this is a, an experience that it links us and, and binds us and connects us um, across space and, and time. So that's all very academic sounding. Um, and there will be a little bit of that in, in what I'm about to say. Um, half of what I have is scripted, half is unscripted. So I'll probably read for a while and then, then I'll chat. But I actually tend to work best off images. So there's a QR code there um, displayed on the post. And if you want to scan it, you'll be able to see the images that I'm talking about. But I'll try and describe them for those of you who can't uh, pull up the images on, on your phone uh, as I go. So um, I'm just going to pick up my and I had covered in plastic. I had visions of uh, standing in a torrential down downpour wearing a, a poncho trying to read this. Um, so firstly then, um, uh, it's uh, hello everybody is what I've written here. Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation. I hope you're enjoying your day despite the inclement weather and look it's good. Uh, and somehow it seems fitting that we should have to endure and focus in this watery environment. So that was after the nine o'clock news last night I wrote the introduction when it looked like we'd be in a thunderstorm today. So the other speakers in this session are offering perspectives on swimming from the world of literature and from their own personal experiences of endurance swimming. And what binds us all together I think today is the figure of Mercedes Gleitze whose passion for the water led her to set new standards for long distance swimmers. Um, of her day and to inspire others to test their own limits in the years since. So I think we need to kind of think about her. She's on our badges, but she's a, she's a kind of an informing presence today. Um, she embodied the pioneering spirit of women of her era and also through her character and through her achievements, she transcended social and political boundaries, in particular bringing a harmonious unity to her British and post-imperial Irish audiences through her endeavours around the coastline of both territories. And I think that British-Irish coastal connection has once again benefited from the ger generous spirit of Mercedes Gleitze today. And this project is bringing people together in Dublin, in Cork, in Donica uh, in, in in the coming year to reflect on our shared love of the water and to consider our, our debt to the pioneering spirit of, of Mercedes Gleitze. So, uh, Irish women, along with their British sisters, took to the water in all senses of the phrase from about the 1870s onwards in terms of more increased participation. Though as that gentleman in the audience said, people had been swimming since the, the late 1600s and, and particularly from the, from the 1700s on as well. So um, the press in the initial years here in Ireland were inclined to marginalise and to trivialise women, women's bathing exploits, but it gradually became both a supportive advocate of women's swimming and also via the letters pages of the newspapers, a forum for women's and men's opinions and wishes in relation to the subject. So the female body during this period, and the period I'm talking here is sort of 1870, we'll say to 1940, as in other historical periods, was itself a field of struggle. So women's bodies were contested. And the, the habitus, the, the mode of being of Irish women was connected to their imbrication in a number of other overlapping fields of struggle in this period. And these were connected to issues such as suffrage, sexuality, ideal citizenship, class, and also new possibilities of consumption. And my contribution today is to briefly set out the historical context in Ireland for women's swimming and bathing activities in the 20s and 30s, particularly in order to shed some light on how Mercedes exploits would have been understood at the time by different groups in Irish society, and also to indicate how women's swimming progressed in Ireland at that time. This first image, which I'm not even going to attempt to show you because it's so small, depicts a group of men and women around a bathing uh, location in Portrush in Northern Ireland. And women are emerging from the water 
and they're wearing the kind of knickerbockers and, and tops and uh, one woman is wearing something that appears to be a kind of a nightdress and they're obviously a source of spectacle because of all the onlookers that are gathered there to watch them and this image was taken in 19, 1900. So um, Fergus Barron's book uh, Swimming for a Century which was published in 1993 to mark the centenary of the Irish Amateur Swimming Association gives a chronological account of the growth and development of club swimming on the island of Ireland, most of which in the early days took place in open air pools and sea baths. And it wasn't until the late 1950s when heated indoor pools were more consistently introduced. Sea swimming had become increasingly popular since the late 1700s as its therapeutic benefits began to be recognized and recommended by medics. And this led, of course, to the growth of the seaside resort an interesting account of which can be found in Jane Austen's unfinished novel, Sanditon. And with the introduction of rail travel in the 19th century, people were able to travel to the seaside in increasing numbers and the beach became what is now termed a vacation scape. Uh, there are some scant references to Irish women swimming in these years, but as Barron records, it is easiest to track their watery progress from the 1870s on when they joined in with gusto as their male counterparts began the process of experimenting with swim technique, competing, establishing rules and standards, clubs and associations, etc. Uh, at this period as well, Captain Matthew Webb's conquest of the English Channel inspired many to set their own goals. Um, and Webb swam the channel in the nude, which was a costuming style typically preferred by men in those days. <laughs> Women, on the other hand, for reasons of modesty and propriety, were forced to swim in cumbersome garments, which became very heavy when sweat and posed a danger to them when swimming. So there were a number of drownings of women uh, at that time linked to the fact that they were wearing these incredibly uh, waterlogging uh, costumes. So uh, B. Berman notes of women's clothing that it reflected ideas of the feminine as associated with frivolity, helplessness, compliance and in action. So, you know, the design of clothing, I suppose, in a way was uh, intended to limit women's physical mobility um, and, and, and to curtail uh, possibilities for them. So in the images that you can see uh, of the Portrush ladies bathing place that you can't see, but that you can imagine, and the novelty postcard, which is the second slide, it's a novelty postcard from Tremor, and it's got three lovely ladies emerging from the waves wearing uh, enormous costumes and hats and uh, looking very jolly and it's a postcard from 19, 1927 by which stage those costumes were already well out of, uh, of date. Um, so the American dress uh, reform movement from around the mid 19th century had sought to introduce clothing that made it possible for women to participate comfortably in sports such as cycling whilst retaining requirements for modest dress and women swimmers and male allies lobbied in the Irish press as elsewhere they did for suitable swimwear to be introduced for women in the face of considerable resistance from authorities. So slide three shows an image of the Australian swimmer Annette Kellerman. So she, uh, she was quite a star in her day. She was known as the Australian Venus. Um, a Harvard University professor measured her uh, dimensions and concluded that she embodied the perfect, uh, perfect female sh shape and she resembled uh, the Venus de Milo. So that was a, a kind of a, an early branding exercise in a way and, and allowed her to present herself as the ideal woman. Um, but she was also a, an extremely accomplished long distance swimmer um, and uh, aquatic performer. So she is featured on slide three uh, that I have today um, in the nude, uh, sitting on a tree branch with her long hair draped over her shoulder, uh, looking very winsome. And um, that is a still from uh, a, a picture called Daughter of the Gods, a Hollywood movie, which was made in 1916. So um, I shall just tell you a little bit more about her because I think it is kind of relevant to the way in which um, discourses around swimming in Ireland at that time uh, unfolded. Um, so she's uh, credited, uh, in fact, with the introduction of the form-fitting unitard. So, she was the person who spearheaded, I suppose, getting rid of these cumbersome woolen, woolen swimming costumes and replacing them with effectively what men were wearing at that stage, which was, you know, short form fitting unitard which, which, with shoulder straps and a, a scoop neck. So um, 
Kellerman was born in uh, 1887 and she was an early 20th century transnational celebrity. She was a champion multi-distance swimmer, a stunt diver, and through her aquatic show, she contributed to the development of synchronized swimming as a sport. Um, she was also a dancer, a vaudevillian, an entrepreneur, a dress reformer, silent era Hollywood film star, a book author, and what we might today call a lifestyle guru or influencer. <laughs> her intensely physical version of femininity coupled with her standing as a lifestyle advocate presented a new set of bodily techniques in ways that were attractive to feminist modernizing forces in Ireland and were threatening to patriarchal traditionalists. Uh, fashion historian Jennifer Craig reminds us that the dress actually wears the body and Kellerman's dress practices are illustrative of this. Women sw swimmers of her era were generally swathed in layers of wool costuming um, and this was completely impractical. Kellerman had designed her own swimsuit, a form-fitting unitard, an adaptation of, the, adaptation of the male bathing suits which allowed her freedom of movement. But in do doing so, she had exposed her bare shoulders and legs and revealed a new silhouette, that of the athletic female. In altering her swimming costume, Kellerman was following in the footsteps of the female pioneers of the American dress reform movement I had already mentioned. And her swimsuit design was deemed daring and attracted considerable public attention. However, it fitted in with suffragist ideas around apparel and more importantly for her, allowed her to compete and perform more effectively. She continued to wear her suit and where leg coverage was obligatory, she wore it with tights sewn on from mid thigh. And this uh, style eventually became the style favoured by all women swimmers and bathers in Western society. Um, she visited Dublin and Belfast several times in the early 1900s, performing her aquatic spectacles in various theatres, competing exhibition swims in public baths and lecturing on diet and exercise. Her performances were well received by Irish media, but there is a particular media interest uh, or public interest in her Hollywood films screened in Dublin during the years of the First World War, which were also the years in which British imperial rule was on the wane. Though in the 1910s and teens, that was neither a certainty nor desired by all Irish citizens at the time. The battles for women's suffrage were also being fought by Irish suffragists, including militant suffragists at this time as well. On July the 13th, 1912, for instance, when Kellerman was touring and performing in Ireland, four suffragists were on trial in Dublin for smashing windows in public buildings. And at the Stockholm Olympics, the first gold medal in women's Olympic swimming had just been won by a first generation Australian athlete of Irish descent, Fanny Durack. The end of British imperial rule was imminent. Um, oh, sorry. I've, 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 read that already. Uh, Kellerman's Hollywood films were screened across Ireland and attracted audience in considerable numbers, as in 1915 in Neptune's Daughter, she performed in a body stocking which made it appear as if she were naked. And in 1916 in the aforementioned Daughter of the God, she became the first woman to appear nude and in motion in a Hollywood film. So by in motion, I mean uh, moving. There had been nude women in Hollywood films prior to that, but they were all immobile, stationary. Um, uh, and she most well, certainly was not. So in motion for her meant swimming, performing a series of daring stunt and uh, performing a series of daring stunt dives. Her swim spectacles and her performances uh, aroused the ire of Catholic conservatives and the Dublin campaign against immoral literature had invaded against her and uh, subsequently in, in later years, in, in 1916 rather, a cinema screening in uh, Fibsborough had been disrupted by members of the Dublin of the Catholic Dublin Vigilance Committee. Um, her Irish performances shed light on the conflict for the hearts and souls of ordinary Irish people, being fought by Irish cultural nationalists who were in favour of gender equality and conservative nationalists who had a decidedly restricting view of what Irish womanhood should be. So against a backdrop of modernisation, Competing models of citizenship between diverse imperial nationalist and unionist stakeholders were proffered and challenged in what Alice Kessler Harris called gendered imaginaries. Um, and I'm quoting Feldman here, the hegemonic process of constructing a nationalist ideology depends upon distinguishing between self and other, us and them in the creation of a common shared identity. Women as symbol, men as agents of the nation, colonized space as feminine, 
colonial power as masculine. So there was a sense at the time that amongst conservative nationalists that Ireland had been somehow emasculated by being occupied, by being colonized and somehow was feminized. So in order to recoup a sense of national identity, it was important to be masculine and assertive and also to very clearly distinguish between uh, gender identities. So conservative um, Irish nationalists anxiety around emascul emasculation fueled fantasies of a form of militarized recuperative Catholic muscular masculinity capable of repelling the colonizers and seeding a strong new nation. The conservative envisioning of the female citizen position, positioned her as a virtuous considered homemaker, the soul of the nation, the guardian of tradition, and the very antithesis of a supposedly non-Irish, liberated and decadent modern womanhood, embodied particularly in the 1920s, at least in the figure of the flapper. Irish cultural nationalists, on the other hand, were in favor of equality between the sexes, advocating for citizenship rights for all men and women and for their full participation in public life. Newspapers such as the Irish Citizen, founded in 1912 by the Irish Women's Franchise League, reported consistently on women's issues, often pointing at the hypocrisy of the mainstream press, which criticised militant suffragists, but not militant unionists, in particular the Irish Times, is what I'm thinking of there. So the early years of the 20th century for women swimmers were marked by debates around swim apparel, but also the battle was fought for access to training facilities, ample training time, proper changing facilities, and indeed to particular beach locations, all against this kind of turbulent political and social mm -hmm. uh, backdrop. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the battle for, for supremacy in terms of who got to decide what was feminine behaviour, what was masculine behaviour. Um, place names in Ireland, such as Ladies Beach, Nuns Cove, etc., are reflective of another pre preoccupation of the era, namely mixed bathing which is a source of some horror to conservatives and desired by those who wished for progress. So in 1913, an evening Herald reporter roved the beaches at Clontarf and Merion to investigate for himself why, according to letters to the Irish press, mixed bathing does not obtain to the same extent in Dublin as in other places in the United Kingdom. And the reporter concludes tartly that it is prevailing prudery and a lack of suitable changing facilities that are preventing the fathers and brothers from teaching the girls of the family how to swim. He then advocates for women swimming in the characteristic blend of the patronising yet supportive stance typical of many reformers of the era and also of, of many of the journalists who were supportive but also patronising of, of women's endeavours in the water. Um, he writes, so long as the folk of both sexes wear proper costumes, I think there should be mixed bathing because it is a well-known fact that women make better swimmers, are more confident the water, in the water and develop life-saving tendencies much quicker when they get their courage in the presence of men. <laughs> <laughs> women are naturally nervous, but as one who has been in a couple of life-saving experiences, it is wonderful what a woman can do when she knows what a good male, that a good male swimmer is in her vicinity. <laughs> So another 1913 letter writer lamented, and this, this is from, coming from another sort of perspective, that Ireland is being flooded by a wave of sensuality. I'm really tempted to put on an accent when I'm reading this. <laughs> I, I want to do a Healy Ray accent, you know, so on, much. <laughs> Ireland is being flooded by a wave of sensuality. <laughs> <laughs> Threatens to destroy the purity of our Irish womanhood. Every effort is made to degrade females who apparently are unconscious of the danger. <laughs> I don't know if that was Healy Ray or not. <laughs> <laughs> It's, a, it's mean. <laughs> so the author who signs himself Aloysius, and I hope there are none here, <laughs> note, notes that objectors to mixed bathing will have earned the heartfelt gratitude of every decent mother in the country, which in itself is significant, I think. So Aloysius's correspondence is reflective of the more generalized desire to contain women's sexuality, to infantilize them and to link moral and ideological purity to Irish nationhood. Clodagh Anson, a member of the Anglo-Irish establishment, um, described public reactions to the mixed bathing habits of her family and friends in that era when she writes, we then took to bathing in the boat cove at high tide with our friends and this didn't go down at all well, as mixed bathing was considered very fast in Ireland at that time, meaning racy as you know. 
There was an article in the Dublin, in the Dungarvan Observer saying that the disgusting British practice of mixed bathing is being carried on in Ardmore, corrupting the morals of the children in the nearby houses. And the next week they wrote again, in spite of our protest of last week, this disgusting practice is still carried on. <laughs> so um, by the early 1900s, however, strict regulations, including bylaws, um, uh, uh, had determined the segregation of the sexes at opposite ends of the beaches and in separate sections of the urban and beachside baths. However, these regulations were often flouted and in practice, men and women often frequented whatever locations they wanted to, regardless of uh, designation. So that's, that's kind of the scripted so part um, out of the way, because I, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, bring home to you the kind of environment that Mercedes was, was arriving into in the, in, in the 1920s, the discussions around the costumes, the discussions around uh, mixed bathing, um, and and um, to also, I suppose, alert you to the fact that there were very mixed reactions in the in the Irish public. Broadly speaking, people were supportive of women in the water at the time in the press. But um, once uh, the 1937 constitution came into place, once uh, you know the uh, constitution was written, the articles were there about women's rightful place being the home. Um, there was definitely uh, a, a more uh, conservative impulse in terms of. Um, containing what, what women did. So uh, slide six uh, has um, uh, Archbishop John Charles McQuaid, who was appointed the Archbishop of Lub Dublin in 1940, marching along the street with a, with a train, uh, with his lacy dress and his train behind him and the train being held by uh, a younger uh, priest. And I suppose what, is, what was interesting to me was to consider the, the, the apparel of the arch, Archbishop swathed in, 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 in his robes with um, the, the image above, which is Annette Kellerman sitting in the nude on a branch, um, uh, the perfect embodiment of the healthy, happy, athletic, modern woman uh, of the early 20th century. And I'd like to put Mercedes Gleitze in that category as, as well too. Um, so she came to Ireland and as, as those of you who've read D Doralanda Pember's wonderful book will know, um, she, moved around the coast and and performed exhibition swims, also did some long distance swimming. And in Galway, at the invitation of the uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce, she, she um, completed a long distance swim from uh, uh, Inishman, I think, into Spittle. She had yeah. intended to, to go right into Salt Hill, but uh, okay. uh, the swim finished at, at Spittle. And, um, that's, that swim was, a, was an entirely remarkable swim and there was incredible press coverage of it and, and a really positive reaction. But what Fergus Barron tells us in the book, uh, and he's quoting here from one of the Galway newspapers, is an editorial comment on, on the significance of the swim for, for swimming more generally in the, in the area. Um, if Miss Mercedes Gleitze has done nothing else for Galway than to stimulate the establishment of a swimming club, her marvellous achievement will have fully justified itself. So in the wake of Mercedes Gleitz's visit to Galway, swimming clubs were established in the area. More people took to the water, more people began to swim. So she, she made a, a really important uh, contribution to, mm. the, to the growth of swimming in that area. And I think uh, it behooves us you know, to, to, to remember uh, our foremothers and our forefathers uh, who, who, who have, uh, I suppose, helped us to, to come into the water today. And these are the people who um, went before Lisa and Rosie, who are going to talk to you now, who are both, I think, absolutely perfect embodiments of the spirit of, of Mercedes Gleitze uh, and, and of other wonderful swimmers. Um, only the other day I learned that um, Samuel Beckett's um, uh, cousin, I think, was uh, a top swimmer in Ireland in the 30s and 40s, and, and Beckett's uncle had been an outstanding uh, swimmer himself in the early 1900s, a champion swimmer. So uh, the connections with, with, with literature are, are, are rich as well. 
So I don't want to uh, dwell on this anymore. Uh, the image credits are on the very last slide and there's also a photograph from the Gilamine in Tremor, which is the very final slide. I'm a Washbird woman and that's where I would have begun my swimming is out there uh, looking at a sign that said men only and, uh, and walking right past us, uh, past it into the water. And you'll see now the sign has been updated to say that the, the sign is purely there for historical purposes. So uh, I, I hope that that wasn't too rambling and um, maybe that you've gotten some uh, ideas and inspiration of your own from what I've had to say today. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm Lisa Cummins um, and I'm a long distance swimmer. Um, my talk is going to be a bit more rambly, I think, than the, the past two and a bit more informal. Um, so I'm just going to kind of tell my story about how I got into long distance swimming and what I've done in the last few years and stuff. Um, and the other thing I'm going to kind of intersperse is a few of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, so some of them are like they're, they're, they're all from swimming, but they can kind of be applied to, to other areas of life, too. Um, so my swim journey or my, my long distance swim journey started in 2007. Um, I had just run the Cork Marathon and I was looking for a new goal. And I decided that I wanted to swim the channel. I hadn't done any open water in, you know, any recent open water up until then. Um, so it, I suppose, came from a different path to a lot of other people. Um, I was a swimmer as a kid, but not a, not a competitive swimmer. I would have done come through the life-saving route um, and I would have done swim teaching kind of as a young adult as well. So I was always in the pool, but never, I'm not fast. I was never on that, that side of things. Um, but yeah, I decided to just wanted to swim the channel and I signed up um, about 18 months in advance of my swim and kind of started training. Um, and then I suppose a few months into my training, um, things were kind of going well with the training. And then I decided to change it to a two-way swim, which is like going <laughs> from England to France and then turning around and swimming back again. Um, so the reasoning behind that, I think, was kind of that I, I at this stage, I had it, it had never been done by an Irish person before. Um, it, it had sparked interest from kind of reading other people's stories of doing it and kind of made the decision with my coach that rather than, you know, going and doing a one way and then coming, turning around and going into another year of training to do, you know, something similar but longer, I just said we'd give it a go and see what happened um, and put all the training to use hopefully once rather than having to, to turn around <laughs> and do it again. Um, so I suppose, yeah, all of this seems kind of very rash and I suppose I'm probably kind of skimming over a bit as well, you know, but um, I suppose once I made the decision, it really wasn't rash at all. Um, I had 18 months of fairly full on training. Um, I So I had signed up for, for a swim in September 2009. Um, in, in the summer of 2008, I would have kind of built up my open water experience and kind of done, you know, longer stuff to, to see what I was able for. And then September 2008, um, I came on board with the coach and started doing the, the longer pool stuff. Um, and I mean, it was some really long pool stuff. I had um, 80,000 meter weeks, a number of those that year. Um, and then gym work on top of that. And then once I got into it, so from the end of May, I went to the open water full time, didn't go back to the pool. And I would have been doing 120 kilometer weeks there. So basically getting up, going to the sea, coming home, <laughs> eating, <laughs> sleeping, going back again. Um, it was life for a while. At the time I was doing a, a PhD, so I was lucky that I kind of took about six months out of it and I was able to just do this pretty much full time. Um, so it was literally eat, sleep, swim. That was my, my whole life. Um, I also did a, a 14 hour training swim that summer just to kind of see, you know, what I was able for. So I suppose in that, that was probably the distance of a channel swim anyway. So it kind of going over to England, I knew that I was, I had that in me. Um, and I did, I did an overnight swim to practice swimming at night and, you know, getting used to kind of swimming into four and five o'clock in the morning when the body really doesn't want to do a whole lot. Um, and I did a few a few swims of kind of really long swims two days in a row as well to practice kind of, you know, swimming when tired and things like that. Um, 
and I suppose the other more more fun part of all of the training was I ate and ate and ate and ate, and ate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would have been eating like 5,000 calories a day um, which sounds great but when you're in the water for like on average probably six to eight hours every day it's actually really hard to fit in all the food so eating started to become a bit of a chore as well but saying that I wouldn't complain about it now so um, I suppose just coming back to the lessons learned from all of it um, the one thing I did kind of realize or did kind of think back on afterwards I at that year I, I injured my shoulder in the May of that year and I didn't step back from my training like my physio told me to step back you know everyone around me was kind of saying you know just take a break but in my head it was like the swim is September it's not that far off and if I take a break from the training how is it going to impact and I pushed on and pushed on and in the end I ended up like I still have a shoulder injury now like you know it's not it doesn't bother me day after day and I've been able to do other long swims in the meantime but it niggles still and even the day before my channel swim when I was doing just doing a warm-up swim in, in Dover Harbour my swim my, my shoulder was at me and it was like on my mind going what if it happens tomorrow you know so I suppose one of the things I learned was kind of know when to step back so you know it's great to work hard towards a goal and you know that can be any kind of a goal but also it's really important to know when you need to take a step back and when you need to kind of give yourself a break and you know kind of push the reset button and go back you know I might have if I had taken two weeks off at that stage it might have just been enough or, or not even taken them off but just done less for a bit you know and I suppose you know regrets and all of that but at the time I thought I was doing the right thing but as I say anyway let's move on so um in September 2009 or yeah 2009 I went over to Dover and faced into horrible weather for about 10 days, kind of waiting for the the wind to die down and looking at the water from the England side and everything looked great, but the, the wind was blowing in France. And there were two other um, swimmers that I trained with in Cork that were waiting in Dover at the same time. So the three of us were panicking that we weren't going to get to swim and that our tide window was going to pass us by. Um, but it didn't, thankfully. And on the 19th of September, after after the 10-day wait, um, I got into the water in Dover at half past 10 in the morning, 10.35 on a Saturday morning. And I basically swam for the weekend. I <laughs> <laughs> I landed in France at Wissant at one o'clock in the morning, um, landed on a beach to a group of teenagers who were having a beach party. And <laughs> I think, didn't know what was going on you know there was a boat out in the water like there was me swimming in my sports swimmer was swimming in behind me and um they just scattered like i'd say they were terrified it was like customs or police or something they all they, they made a run for it so we we made their night i'm sure um and i had a seven minute stop in france so you're allowed 10 minutes um if it goes over 10 minutes you're considered to be illegally entering the country so I had 10 minutes or I, I took seven minutes to kind of re-grease. You're also not allowed if anyone touch you. So it's kind of a whole juggling act of, you know, re-greasing and not getting your hands greasy because you don't want your goggles to get greasy and trying to eat something. But at this stage, my throat was also, you know, covered in salt. So, you know, it was just a whole, <laughs> do I turn around? Do I go back again? At this stage, I was convinced that I was in the water like 18 hours or something. I was actually kind of 14 and a half and I was convinced my pilot wasn't going to let me turn. But my support swimmer just said, turn around, get in the water and just see what happens. So at this stage, I kind of figured, you know, I've got my one way done. Everything else is a bonus. So turned around and started off. Um, and the the way back was interesting. I ended up kind of hovering off the cliffs of Dover again for about eight hours with the tide carrying me sideways Jeez. and not being able to make much headway. Um, luckily I actually didn't see a whole lot because I was actually the, the other side of the boat that the cliffs were really visible um, so the people on the boat were freaking out everyone that was watching my little tracker dot was freaking out but I was kind of just <laughs> a little bit oblivious um, but yeah so the eventually what happened was the, the tide was hit, heading me towards uh, Dungeness which is a point on the, the English coast the talk was that if I didn't hit that point, uh, it was going to turn. It was going to be another six hours, basically, before I'd end up making land. And I think, you know, if that was going to happen, there was going to be a, a no-go kind of, you know. But luckily, I managed to get, to get in. And at 9.35 on the Sunday evening, 
I hit over. And <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. So landed at a, a nuclear power plant, which was interesting <laughs> in itself. Um, to this time a couple of fishermen who thought the whole thing was pretty cool and wanted photographs and I've got photographs of the, the, the two of them with myself they had like one set of teeth between the two of them they're hilarious they were hilarious but uh, so yeah and um, yeah I had a bit of a, a roller coaster after that kind of didn't expect the, the media coverage and kind of the, the whole excitement after it but it was all it was all pretty cool um, and I suppose, again, my big, my big takeaway from that was the, you know, don't be afraid to, to have the big dreams. It doesn't have to be a two-way channel, obviously, you know. But I mean, whatever it is, you're, you know, if, you're, if there's something you're thinking about doing and you're prepared to work towards it, then go for it, you know. There were, I had quite a few people, like, not, not, not my close people in Cork and stuff because we have a brilliant long distance swimming community in Cork and we did even back then it's, it's grown a lot since um but I had people emailing me from around the world kind of saying you know you shouldn't be doing this like you can't go and do a two-way swim without having done a one-way swim you know and I kind of go you know someone who goes to a one-way swim doesn't like swim halfway and then get out and see if they can you know it's like a two-way distance isn't it's not a magic distance you know it's like I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do as much as I can and see where it takes me you know yeah and um I suppose I was lucky in that I had a few people very close to me who were very supportive and who just kind of didn't never made me think that it wasn't a possibility um so yeah I think that was that was a really big thing out of the year was just kind of you know follow the dreams and definitely don't listen to the the people in your ear kind of going you can't do this you know and really enjoy proving them wrong that's what I I did anyway really enjoy proving them wrong so so then I suppose what I've done since um after the English Channel I kind of did a few random things I did a a Lake Zurich relay swim so that's about 26 and a half kilometers in 2010 um in 2014 I did the Rottnest Island swim in Perth which is nearly 20k and I also did around Key West that year which was a really interesting swim very warm but very beautiful. We saw turtles on that one, which you don't see in the English Channel, which was nice. Um, and in 2015, I did a half Ironman, just kind of for something different. <laughs> 2017, I did the Ring and Kerry Cycle. Again, something a bit different, kind of out of swimming for a bit. But um, And then in the middle of all of that, in 2013, I had done, um, I had attempted the Manhattan Island Marathon Swim, which is a, a lap of Manhattan Island. Um, some like 48 kilometers I think but it's very tight assisted so you kind of go around in, in eight hours ish depending on your, your speed obviously um, it's a as I say it's a very tight swim and unfortunately that year we had there had been Hurricane Sandy that year there was a load of the boat pilots didn't have their boats because they were wrecked in Hurricane Sandy and it caused a whole, a whole load of problems for the organizers in the end on the day the swim started about an hour and a half late and I'm a plodder. I'm not a speedy swimmer by any means. And in the end, because we started late, I think 38 out of the 40 swimmers or something, there was a, hu- a huge number didn't make a, a particular tide break. If you didn't make it, like if you, if, you know, if, if you ma- didn't make it, the tide was going to turn and it was going to be six hours of swimming backwards, basically. So what they decided to do with everyone who didn't make it was we were boat assisted, as they called it. They put us on our boats put us past the tide break and if you wanted to get back in you could which I did um I suppose I was probably I probably missed maybe a kilometer of the swim got back in did the the rest of the swim I felt the swim was finished in my head Mm. because I kind of felt you know I'd done most of it I would have done the rest if it had started some time where I felt that I would have anyway um but it was never an official Manhattan swim because of the fact that you know it was obviously both sisters there were a few people on the day that were fast enough to get to the that point so they had they had official swims but as I say the majority of us didn't so then in 2017 um there was a double lap of Manhattan run for the first time <laughs> <laughs> so it had been done as a solo before kind of I think four or five different people had done it but in, t- in 2017 there were a number of people did it on the one day as an event um and it kind of got me thinking like I kind of had unfish- unfinished business in Manhattan, but I never really wanted to go back and just do the same thing again because I felt that it was done. So I kind of said, maybe give this a go and it's something new because it's a double. So and, you know, go with the whole theme of doubles. Why not? <laughs> so I put the I put my name down with the organizers um, 
in the summer of 2017 for if there was going to be a 2018 event and um, kind of started training away. I got confirmation in, in January 2018 that I was actually in the event. Uh, so still training away, doing, you know, quite a lot of mileage because it was going to be another very long swim. Um, and then unfortunately found out in the at the start of May that year that one of the bridges, so it's, they call the swim 40 bridges because there's 20 bridges around Manhattan and then you were doing it twice. Mm. So um, one of the bridges is a railway bridge and it was going to be closed for a weekend in the summer to be for maintenance. And the talk was that it was going to be closed the weekend of the swim. And if it was because obviously they were going to be doing construction work on the bridge, they couldn't have it, us swimming under it insurance purposes just in case anything happened so this was the start of may the swim was due to happen the 20th or the 19th and 20th of july and you know we were in full there was three of us to do the swim the three of us were in full flow with our training um but didn't know if the event was going to happen um in the end i found out on the 2nd of july that the event was going ahead <laughs> and <laughs> had to scramble to i look i was still training luckily but I had to scramble to get my flights together. Um, I'm very lucky, I have family in New York, so I was able to stay with them and I also had one of them as my crew. So at least I didn't have to worry about kind of that side of accommodation and all of that. Um, but yeah, it was a whole a whole mess of kind of trying to get prepped for something that, you know, was happening literally two weeks later. Um, and I suppose, again, coming back to the lessons, it was uh, the big lesson I learned from it was, you know, n not everything always goes to plan. Um, I found it very tough that year to train when, you know, the first few months of training, I didn't even know if I was in the event. And then I was training for a bit, you know, everything going great. And then suddenly it was like, we don't know if it's going to happen. And, you know, I had to do kind of eight and 10 hour training swims, not knowing if they were even going to be for anything, you know, um, which was, it was really hard to keep the head at that stage. Um, the one thing I do think if I was ever doing something long like that again, I think I'd have a backup, you know, I'd have something else so that if it didn't happen, mm. that I'd still be able to use the training for something rather than just kind of, you know, training willy nilly kind of, you know. Um, so anyway, on the 19th and 20th of July, everything came together and I did two laps in Manhattan in just over 21 hours, 21 hours and two minutes. Um, it was a very different swim to many of my other swims or many of my other swims here anyway, it was warm. Um, the water was, I think, 24, 25 degrees. Oh. Um, the air was a lot hotter. <laughs> um, there was loads to see. There's not loads to see in the English Channel. You know, there's <laughs> ships and there's, I think I saw two fish in my whole swim. Um, this way, this swim, like you do a lap by day and a lap by night, which is really, really cool. Um, seeing the whole city lit up from the water was, was amazing. I had an NYPD escort the whole way around. So as I said, there were three of us swimming. They gave us each an, an NYPD boat wow. um, just to keep all the traffic away um, and just you know, obviously keep us safe and just if anything happened, you know. Um, and then the other thing, which I kind of mentioned earlier, was it's a very tidal swim. So this time around, it was actually different organizers. They literally had us like I got a, a model of my swim a few days beforehand based on my swim speed they were able to predict exactly where I was going to be like literally to the minute now I mean obviously it doesn't work that way but they took my speed plugged it into the currents plugged it into the tides and were, were able to like I, I started at like something like 34 minutes past an hour you know it was literally bang on kind of to everything organized around the tides you know um after getting through Hell's Gate, which was the my problem spot the time before, um, the pressure was off this time round, and I was able to kind of float around the island nearly for a lap, um, because the tides were with me the whole way round, um, and at three a.m. I was literally treading water and floating up the East River because if I got to Hell's Gate the second time too quickly, the tide was coming against me, and I would have been float uh, trying to swim against it. So it was actually in my best interest to just hang on and hold tight mm. and chat with my kayaker for. A few hours to try and kind of get there slower so that was obviously something that's totally different to any other swim that you know you'd ever do which was uh it was it was an interesting experience um once i got to hell's gate that time around it was it was hard going for the rest of it um i have to say the last couple of hours were were really really tough but again with the, with the new york skyline it's kind of easy to figure out where you are or at least where you're going to um, and we were we were finishing down by the the Freedom Tower kind of direction. So like you can see that from way 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 back, obviously, which is good and bad. But at least you kind of you, you saw your final spot, you know. 
Um, and I suppose, again, my learning point from that swim, um, so uh, the, the, the warm air and water was something that I wasn't prepped for, really. It's hard to prep for when you're coming from here, you know. And I was very nervous, like, in the lead up. The, the, once I got to New York and realised just how hot it was, um, I was very nervous about being hydrated and having enough electrolytes because a few weeks before in a solo lap, someone had been pulled out and hospitalised because of electrolytes. They depleted their electrolytes and it ended up you know, quite sick on drips and was, was fine afterwards. But I suppose it was in my head that I didn't want that, you know. So last minute I did the thing that no one is ever supposed to do when I changed my feed plan and um, decided that I was going to just change everything up and do some, you know, add in things that I didn't normally take. Everyone always says, don't change your plans at the last minute, but, you know, didn't listen and decided that, um, you know, I, I suppose I was just, just very nervous of, of the the circumstances and stuff, you know. Um, and as a result, I ended up with stomach issues for quite a lot of the swim. I was vomiting and just cramps and stuff for a lot of the swim. Um, so I suppose the, the thing I learned from that really is to trust your plan. You know, if you spent years training for this kind of stuff, mm. you know, you know what you're doing <laughs> and I should have known what I was doing, you know. Um, I know not to make last minute changes. I knew that beforehand, but I still did it. And uh, yeah, it's just, you know, trust yourself, you know. Next thing is what, you know, a lot of people ask when they hear about my exploits. Um, and I suppose at the moment, I don't have any plans for what's next. I had a baby last year, so she's kind of taking up my time. Um, I have a plan at some point to swim around. I live in an island in, in Cork and Cove. So I plan to swim around that at some point. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other swims out there. But yeah, they'll be they'll be still out there in 10 years time when she's a bit bigger and I have a bit more money to play with. So, so all good. So, yeah. uh, look, I'm delighted to be able to have a chat and just give you a little bit of I suppose the background as to, to, to how I ended up first, uh, I suppose, playing rugby with, with Ireland and following in my, my dad's and my brother's footsteps in doing that. Um, and just a little note on that. Um, I actually was pregnant playing for Ireland. Um, <laughs> Did you I, I, no, I didn't get pregnant. <laughs> I was pregnant. <laughs> pregnant for, um, one of my best friends had gotten very bad news. She got term. She was had a terminal diagnosis. Um, at the Christmas, I was working full time, married, playing international rugby, and I suppose she passed away on the twentieth of, of February. And you know, when you're when you're playing high level anything, your your body responds very differently, and of course never took any notice that I didn't have a period in the, in the, in the time that we were playing matches. Uh, my friend Olive <laughs> passed away. Uh, then I said, Jesus, I wonder, is there a possibility? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, so actually I have a son who has international rugby caps. He's now 15. <laughs> I'm just saying that so that you know. <laughs> so that in a few years time, um, when you, you hear that, uh, oh yeah, Rosie Foley, that, I remember hearing of her, yeah. And I actually breastfed him before um, I played um, international rugby on a, a number of occasions because we actually went to the he was born in uh, October 2005. The Women's World Cup, the second one that I got to was in 2006 in Edmonton in Canada. And my goal was to get there. And to get there, we, we played training matches and before the training matches and after the training matches against Wales and Scotland, I breastfed my, my baby uh, without the coach knowing. <laughs> <laughs> my, yes, oh. but so so that you know, his name is Oshin Minogue, by the way. Oh. He's be six, sixteen in October, um, and uh, he he sometimes gets reminded that that has happened to him because, unfortunately for him, as you know, every sporting uh, tradition uh, we've lots of buddies and everybody talks and that. Uh, Paul O'Connell knew that uh, Oshin uh, had played rugby in my tummy and Declan Kidney and they were both obviously involved with uh, the Irish men's rugby team so anytime they see this this man from this side up they remind him that he is international <laughs> women's rugby captain. so I'm coming from uh, I suppose I just wanted to give, give you a little bit of a flavor I'm very determined um try not to let too many things get in my way and I suppose that's what I'd like to get across to you guys as well 
life has many ups and downs and we all know that there's never a straight line as we're going anywhere and these things get fired in front of us in some of them are, are good things some of them are, aren't so good thing but what i would the real message i really want to get across to you is we mentioned it already uh getting out into nature and in this case we're getting out into the blue and it, it, it's something phenomenal that that has really really happened but over the years then different people have inspired me first people who inspired me obviously are, are my parents at home and there was never a, a boundary as as regards what we did now myself and my brother anthony there was a little bit over a year now my father would tell you that we're not irish twins i'd say to you we are there's three days in the difference <laughs> Right, three days, right, he's, he's gone over three days. So when we were, anything that was on TV at the time, I think there was like two channels in our house and we grew up in Maru in County Limerick and there was two channels there. And if it was Wimbledon, we were out in the front lawn. If it was the Hurling, we were out with the Hurleys. If it was Gaelic football, soccer, whatever, we were out doing it. Hot, uh, hot summers then, the odd few days that we'd have, there was a river down at Barrington's Bridge, we'd go down and we'd try to pop in there. And, and that's the way we were reared. But my parents had met um, in Killaloo, in County Clare, and we ended up living in Maru for seven years, and then my parents bought a pub in, in Killaloo, and we ended up going to Killaloo. Long story very short, when you live by water, you have to learn how to swim, and that's how my parents wanted it. So we swam in the river. I learned, I taught myself to swim in the river and in the, the little outdoor pool that we still, exist, still exists to this day in, in Killaloo. And pe people like Peter Lacey were teaching people on a piece of rope at the end of the pier head how to swim. <laughs> there was, I could see that people could swim. It was male and female, it made no difference. Um, so we did everything. We did the water sports then out in Killaloo and you know, uh, Jimmy Whelan's, as I've, I've, I've found out that, uh, and Ray's actually would, would have connections, connections with uh, Jimmy Whelan, uh, who the shop across from the pub and you pick out my rag doll with my yellow hair to learn how to swim. And that was my focus to learn how to swim in the first place. Um, and then kind of other things that happened to me when we were in the pub, I remember being upstairs and it happened to be Gertie or Gertrude Elder, Elderly, who was the first woman to swim across the English Channel, black and white uh, uh, movie on TV. And I said to myself at 12, I'll do that. <laughs> I'm doing that, I'll do that. I, I love swimming, I'm doing that, I'm going doing that. So life goes on anyway, and um, I remember that, uh, we'll say, I saw my, my father played with Munster, uh, they beat the All Blacks in 78. I always felt that, you know, everything is achievable. It doesn't matter who you're playing. If it's on a pitch, it's the same pitch for everybody. You, you, we all have the same boots on, etc. I That's how I feel about things. In, in going across from A to B, just like Lisa here, I couldn't care less about how long it is. I don't care about the time. If you want to do something and you need to go from A to B, you go from A to B. In my case, it, it was the English Channel. But in the meantime, uh, I wanted to play sport. And myself and Anthony had grown up more or less together. But when we got to 12, I noticed he had way more opportunities to play than I had. And I could not, as a woman, play or a girl, play rugby because we didn't have any set structures or organization there at the time so i was kind of i suppose i just got on with it i played camogie i played uh hurling all those kind of things um it's it's one of those things that di that didn't uh stop me playing but my parents always drummed into us and i think it's something that has stood to us ever since that when we were playing something we never assumed we were going to be picked or you were going to be wearing that jersey the next day so you never you never looked to tomorrow in our house. And that's that's something that has always stayed with me. So you, you really live the moment. We live what we have. And that's that's another thing, you know, that I think Lisa has, uh, kind of alluded to it as well, that yeah. you just kind of, you just get on, you get on with it. You you make do with what you have and you, you keep going forward. But like, I have to say, I did always want to play rugby. I'd seen my dad play. I saw my brother play. Um, I still couldn't play, but I, I got I got to, to play when I got to college and I, I do everything a little bit differently, right? So I'm just going to tell you this, right? So I went to, to, to college, dislocated my knee, couldn't repeat the exams because they had a repeat system at the time. I'm that old. Um, and then 
Uh, my parents wouldn't let you just lounge around at home. You had to work. So I had done water safety just like Lisa. Uh, so I had water safety qualification, could, could teach swimming. So I went, uh, volunteered in St. Vincent's in Lister Gry, uh, special needs for a little while. That led me on to get a full time job in St. Enda Sports Complex in South Hill in Limerick, where I spent the best four and a half years as a full time lifeguard inside there. And then doing all my bits that had to go to, to, to go with it, more swim teaching, all those kind of things. Um, and that, as I was there, I married my husband at 22. Uh, then I went back as a mature student at 23 to UL to do PE and geography. Um, and then uh, about, about two years after that, I, play, I was playing rugby with, I started the, the rugby team in UL that's still going today. Uh, I played with my local club, Shannon Rugby Club, which my uh, my family are very involved with. Moved on to play with Munster, and then uh, about two years later, I got my first Irish cap on the same day that my brother was playing in Italy. So we just kept moving, we kept moving. I was lucky then um, over a number of years to play in Twickenham and above in, in Murrayfield on the same day that my brother was playing as well. So we, 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 had great, we had great crack and great ties, but I remember the one thing that sticks in my mind, and this is the focus thing again, because you can't let the coach give, uh, you can't give the coach any reason in my head that they won't pick you the next day or that they'd have something bad to kind of say about you besides your performance. And I remember Ireland played Scotland men before we were due to play after them, and Anthony was playing, and... Uh, Next thing, uh, my coach, before we went out, he said, no, he said, you're, you're not to be doing anything or saying anything to the lads. They're coming in and we're going out. But Anthony came down along and he said, come here to me, best of luck, kick ass. And I, all I could do was keep looking straight ahead. And all I wanted to do was say thanks very much, but I knew that your man would be looking at me. So again, that little bit of kind of determination and, and, pure, and pure focus. And like when we started playing, not unlike the, the women's um, soccer team, like I borrowed my first uh, tracksuit to play for Ireland. Um, uh, we, we got the jerseys and we had to give them back. All that stuff, we paid for them. We had to look for sponsorship. All those kind of things yeah. are all things that, that keep you going. But the one thing about sport is that it makes you very resilient, uh, resilient and it makes you want more. And I think after my daughter was born and she's now 11, it was either do a little bit of sport or go to something less physical. <laughs> so I thought, I actually, in my naivety, thought that swimming might be a bit... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit naive that way. And, and I know, Catherine, you know this from, from lovely Ned. So uh, Ned Dennison was one of the first people I made, uh, met um, when I started swimming outdoors. So when I joined Limerick Masters, I was not a competitive swimmer, just like Lisa. I went in, I absolutely knew very few people, only the people that I might have seen years ago in St. Enda's when I worked there. So I went in and I said, look, I'm, I start in the slow lane and, and tip, tip away and see how things go. I met um, Andrea Newport, some of you may have met her before or come across her, she chairperson in McMaster's. And she so started chatting in the change room as women do, trying to look after somebody who's new and you're here and it's great. And you know, sure, look, we'll show you the ropes. And that was grand and of course, after a few months, I started getting a little bit brave and it was coming to, towards the summer. And I said to Andrea, I said, how, how about open water swimming? You know, how about swimming outside? Ah, she says there's a great swim in, in Beganish Island down in Valencia, do you know? Um, but Fanula Walsh is the one to, to, to lead you on your way there. So I uh, met the bowl Fanula and Andrea and next thing it was, swim full, can't get in. You'll have to write an essay and it was an essay to Ned Dennison to get you in, right? <laughs> write an essay to Ned Dennison to get you in. So I write an essay to, 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 to do, you're not telling me, <laughs> uh, to, to Ned to get into the swim. So down we went anyway. And as you know, weather, all the rest, um, we didn't get to swim around lovely Beganish Island, which should have been, I think, about a six kilometre swim. Instead, we got to swim down the side of Valencia Island at about eight kilometres. <laughs> Welcome to open water swimming. <laughs> I was hooked. I was hooked, line and sinker. And it was the people that I met. It was the people who were there. It was the people beforehand who said, I are going to be grand. You'll be fine. We'll keep an eye on you. And they didn't like, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you were grand. Because, because, sorry now, Ned swim over me right at the start. And a few more swim 
under and over me and I, I, I tell you I, I find out fairly fairly quickly uh, who, who your friends and, and how you how you get you, you get on but I suppose it, it then what started to happen with me was kind of yeah the, the, you hear of all the fabulous swimmers that we have around and what they're doing and you're kind of going oh yeah I remember yeah I that, this is I've always wanted to do that that channel swim and then it all takes it, it all takes flight but my backyard was Loch Derg, the River Shannon. It hadn't been swung before. And I said in my head, that's a perfect way for my mother not to find out I'm swimming the English Channel. I never, to this day, told my mother because my mother would have said, what would my mother have said? No. Yeah, you're mad. You're a 40 something year old woman with three children. What are you doing? <laughs> so there's a little bit of that culture and tradition and I don't think she's ever forgiven me for it. So about a month before I was due to swim across the English Channel with three people knowing that what I was doing, it was s swim down Loch Derg. My lovely brother said to me, have you not heard of a boat? Um, <laughs> yeah, th this is the support you get, you know? <laughs> have you not heard of a boat? And um, another quip that I got was, I suppose you want to swim back up it as well, do you know? Yeah. Do, just like you, Lisa, <laughs> just like you, go back Listen up. You. Yeah, just like you. So I did that a month beforehand, didn't tell anyone, told my brother, my sister, and my father about two days before we went out to Dover. Uh, didn't want anyone to know because Anthony at the time would have been involved with Munster. He became the Munster coach uh, about two weeks before I swam the English Channel. And just like you were saying, I, I, it wasn't about him. It was about a childhood dream that I wanted to do. And it was something that I wanted to do. But uh, my mother has not forgiven me now. And that's, that's 2014. What's that, seven years? Yes. She'll be over it by now. No, she's not over it. She's, she, she's definitely not, not over it. So, I mean, I suppose, Vanessa, you've a lot to answer for her because when I was talking to the girls this morning, I was coming back with all these things that were in my head because you said to me, what about the transition from rugby to, but actually water was always there. It was always in the background. It was always in my, my family. Uh, I thought of times that we played matches that we went into the sea or we went into ice baths. And the bloody ice bath thing then ended <laughs> up with me swimming an ice mile last January outside in Killaloo in four point whatever oh, water. Yeah something I never wanted to do, but because the pandemic, I suppose, I needed to have a focus. I was swimming every day, I needed a focus. And that for me was my blue, my blue mind, my, what I wanted to do and whether I was going to finish it or do it or whatever, it was, it was a focus. So, you know, they're all the kind of the, the, the dreams and the things that you want to do. Like, I remember, and this is, this is your fault as well, Vanessa, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I, got, I was lucky enough to sail on the Asgard a few times and we actually sailed up the English Channel at one stage, stars in the sky. And when I swam in to, um, from England to, to France, would you, would you believe one of the mad things that was happening was it was getting dark. I'm a plodder as a swimmer, but the Women's World Cup was happening in France uh, in 2014. And my ex players and colleagues or whatever were flying into France I was, I was swimming on the 26th of July. They were flying in on the 27th. And my goal, part of my goal in my head, when you, you have loads of music going in your head, you have loads of lists going in your head. And one of the things I was racing in my head to get to France was before midnight, before the Irish women's rugby team would touch down in, <laughs> in France on the, on the 27th. So there's all, I have a very strange thing going on in my head. They performed really well. They actually went on and beat the All Blacks in that 2014 um, World Cup. So I suppose it's dreams. It's, it's, it's people who've been role models to me, who continue to meet, be role models to me. People I meet every day, people I meet at swims, people I meet in school, at matches. I love that that's how we raise each other and that we lift each other up. And whatever your goal is going forward, I, I would hope that you, you really just take a big deep breath and just as, as Lisa said, you just, you go for it because life is for living, not a dress rehearsal. And I know you're all absolutely wrecked now. <laughs> <laughs> so I've made it as short as I possibly can. And look, thank you so much for, for listening to us. And thank you.